Hi, and welcome to Europe Talks 2021. My name is Hannah Israel. I'm the head of My Country Talks, and I'm really looking forward to guide you through our this year's program. And my name is Sebastian Horn. I'm deputy editor-in-chief at Zeit Online and one of the founders of My Country Talks. Today, thousands of people from all over Europe are meeting with someone they have never met before, a complete stranger, and someone that thinks totally different from them. We have asked our readers nine controversial political questions, such as whether the vaccination against the coronavirus should be mandatory or whether we should introduce an unconditional basic income. And then we matched them into a pair with someone that answered all or most of those questions differently. And this year, our readers got the chance to actually have more than one conversation and to meet several people, since we continuously matched them into uh, discussion pairs since October. And today, most of them are going to meet again. And before we start introducing our this year's media network, maybe you, Sebastian, could say a few words about how Europe Talks actually came into existence. Sure. Um, well, in 2017, um, in our newsroom at Site Online, we came up th uh, with this idea of Germany Talks. We thought it was about time that people actually got out of their filter bubbles and had a conversation with someone they strongly disagree with. Um, and in 2017, there are thousands of people who signed up for this, and the thing really took off. Uh, soon afterwards, um, other media partners and um, publishers from all over Europe started contacting us and asking us whether they could use the same software and um, maybe do the same in their country, since they were also having a rather polarized society at home. At that point, there was really no software, so we decided to build one, and that was the time that we created My Country Talks. And as we were all sitting there with those media partners from several European countries, there was a moment when someone said, shouldn't we be doing this all across Europe so Europeans actually got together and had a conversation? And thus the idea for Europe Talks was born. Very cool. And so um, in the following film, we would like to introduce our this year's media network and tell you a bit more about how Europe Talks actually works. You are wrong. No, you are wrong. You are wrong. No, you are wrong. Hello, my name is Rainer Schüller. I'm deputy editor-in-chief at the daily newspaper Der Standard in Vienna, Austria. Hi, this is Mark from Times of Malta. Hello, everyone. My name is Katerina Sremcevic, and I'm a journalist in a news agency Beta in Belgrade. Soy Enrique Andrés, redactor jefe de Internacional del diario El Confidencial. Hi everyone, this is Georgia Sakula, I'm a reporter for the Ephemerida de Sudacton, Greece. Hello Europe, I'm Patrick and I'm project manager of ENT. We are delighted to be the first Hungarian media partners to join Europe Talks. We at Telex value dialogue, meaningful debate and bringing different opinions together on one platform. Una plataforma creada por más de 20 medios en 17 países para generar un diálogo constructivo entre ciudadanos europeos que piensan diferente sobre los temas más sensibles, como la migración, el cambio climático o los subsidios sociales. We simply ask our readers five yes or no questions about topics like same-sex marriage, immigration or nuclear power. Then we match people who disagreed the most and asked them to have a conversation. We built a unique algorithm with our developers. Now we were able to automatically match all these participants and allow them to meet up. And today, all of Europe is meeting up again. Our algorithm matched pairs with totally different views on climate change, migration, and of course, how to deal with the coronavirus. Europe Talks taught us that that is exactly how the world can change by bringing different people together in one place who don't agree on anything but who are willing to have a civil discussion with each other. I'm very pleased to see that uh, year after year more people are getting involved and I think that this shows us that uh, especially during the pandemic people need to get in touch uh, with citizens from other countries within the European Union and share their concerns. The fact 
that more than 2,000 of our readers have already signed up to participate shows that there is a huge demand for this kind of discussion in Hungary. The dialogue in Serbia is almost dead and that made the society which is separated on us and them and for us as a news agency we're really important to take a part in the project which gives a platform for people to communicate with each other and with the rest of Europe. You get to know other cultures, other perspectives and habits. That is essential and inspiring in a united Europe. It is scientifically proven that whenever two people meet for at least two hours face to face to have a discussion, they change. They change their perspective little by little, discussion by discussion. High five. <laughs> so we found something that we agree on on the topic that we disagree. Yes, yes, the conflict is much less pronounced. Thank you once again to all of your media partners. Um, I think it's a really, really wonderful thing about Europe Talks that so many publishers get together and work cross-border on a project like this, and I hope we'll continue doing so in the future. We also have to thank our sponsors. Without them, this would not have been possible at all. There's the Federal Foreign Office, um, there's the European Cultural Foundation, Allianz Kultur Stiftung, and Fondation Hippogren, who all made this possible uh, with their support. Thank you very much. We also need to send a warm thank you to the Goethe Institutes, especially in London, in Warsaw, Madrid, um, for contributing to this event. And we'll see a lot of videos later on throughout the program that they helped us um, create. And we now have some welcoming words, actually, from someone from the Foreign Office. Uh, Irene Planck is the Director for Strategic Communication at the Federal Office. Um, and before that, until June 2020, she was their Head of Business and Human Rights. Dear participants, dear organizers, we need to talk. Conversations are the glue that holds our society together, help us take on new perspectives and broaden our horizons. They create understanding. The last few months have made us painfully aware that there are issues that threaten to divide our society. In times like these, it is important to seek dialogue, especially with those who may think differently from us. This is especially true with regard to our European partners and neighbors. Only if we seek and find common ground among Europeans on today's topics can Europe be a powerful voice in international politics. This is why the German Federal Foreign Office has supported Europe talks from the beginning. I would really like to congratulate all founders and organizers on what has been achieved. We are thrilled that participants of Europe Talks had the opportunity for the first time to arrange more than one meeting with different counterparts they did not know before. They had the chance to debate topics one-on-one, -on -one, both digitally and if regulations permitted face-to-face. -face. I was actually able to take part, hello Lino from Malta, in such a discussion myself, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, issues that lead to arguments and conflicts have intensified in recent years. Climate change, global migration, the consequences of digitalization are topics that are often avoided when we are making friendly conversations because they lead to divisions between family members and friends, co-workers and colleagues, politicians and the public. Our decreasing ability to find common ground on complex issues is a major threat to democracy. With hate speech skyrocketing during the last year, we saw on the COVID subject, uh, for example, how fast this can turn into aggression. Europe and the world as we know it is at a turning point and we all have the responsibility to make sure that we do not drift further apart. Defending the multilateral global order and the idea of Europe against nationalistic forces is not only an aim for politicians and diplomats, but everybody needs to be heard in this process. So in the times where the need for communication has reached an all-time high, the chance to talk across borders and bridge political differences is an opportunity we should embrace. Europe Talks proves how important it is to step out of our own filter bubbles. And it demonstrates what a unique experience it can be to get to know each other and to exchange different points of view because healthy debates uh, are key to a resilient society. 
So with this in mind, dear participants, dear viewers, dear organizers, talk to each other and remember we are better together. Thank you very much, Irene Plank. Among our this year's participants were also Helen Pasiali from Greece and Peter Vida from Hungary. They have answered all of our questions differently. They have a very different stance on the vaccination. Peter thinks we should force people to get vaccinated. Helen is strictly against it. And they also have very different views on migration or same-sex marriage. We traveled to both Greece and Hungary to meet them, to see how they live, to see what they think, what they feel. And we were also there when they met for the first time. This is the place where I, I feel myself really comfortable. Like, I'm arrived home. I'm really simple-minded in, in somehow. I like to wake up in the morning, I like to pray, rosary, and uh, go to work, cook a dinner, and that's all. Because stability is a kind of shelter for me. It's like God, it's not like God, it's good, it's not. I'm 31 years old, I have three children and I'm living in the outskirts of Budapest. I'm now a teacher. My dream is to enjoy silence on my own land. I would like to build my house on the right side of the, the land, and I would like to grow here grapes because uh, I need some extra money. I am married. I have two children. I work as a cleaning lady. It is something that I had to do because money isn't enough. I also teach English in my free time. My husband is a lorry driver. One of my favorite things in life is drinking coffee. I pray and I say we're okay. We're healthy. We have food in our fridge. If my husband loses his job. He has already told me that he would like to immigrate to Germany. I don't want that. Our culture doesn't mix. One of my dreams is to be able to travel abroad. I've only been to Cyprus because money is enough. I do believe in God, but I don't believe in a God that tells people you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this. I believe in people and their goodwill. Let's get out of my shutter. Let's open uh, to the world. And get off uh, our uh, daily routine. We, we must have to talk to each other. Hi, Pete. To change a little bit, but not giving up myself. Marriage is something which is based on a man and a woman. They are all people. I don't really have uh, gay friends. They have the same rights. It's a pain in my life. The time I'm uh, divorced, my uh, son is living with me, but my daughters are away from me because mothers and fathers love in a different way. Mothers, you know, always just catching the children. Fathers, what are they doing? Fathers are showing the world. So, yeah, I, I have a very, very straight opinion. But I, I don't hate gay people. Migration how we enculturize them. Because if we are not enculturizing them, they will enculturize us. They bring their own catch culture, but they do not, they cannot impose us. I saw mosques and those mosques were full with people and uh, the Christian churches are empty. We could be them. If you want to live in that pluralist Europe, no one wants to leave their homes behind. Where free speech is accepted, where the free speech is coming. It's from Christianity. The values of Europe and Islam is uh, not compatible. Let's have it. 
Let's force the people. I don't think that people should be forced. From born until your death, you have several vaccines, which helps to not die. In. It's not widely tested and it's too soon. I don't think that electric cars are the future. Uh, will all the citizens of Europe be able to buy these cars? Where shall we put the lithium batteries? No, I think that they, they won't. Maybe make the living circumstances better to not uh, have to choose uh, the car, to choose the public transport. Having something without uh, your job, well, I think only the grace of God is uh, freely. I think that uh, in Europe uh, people should be paid equally. Definitely to use trains. Flying makes uh, distance uh, shorter, so... Uh, Let's use uh, the reverse. It is a good idea. It's, it's hilarious that a plane flight is cheaper than taking a uh, a train from Budapest to Wien. Hi! <laughs> so, how are you? How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. What do you bear uh, these times, what, you, what we have now, these uh, COVID times? In Greece, you have to vaccinate? I don't believe that uh, in the necessity of the vaccination, because uh, even vaccinated people get sick. My opinion, vaccination gives uh, less chance to die. It's not well, well tested on kids. I got your point and I understand it, but it's uh, good to hear that you are not denying the whole uh, corona. Uh, one thing that we uh, disagree on, marriage among homosexual people. I think that we can't call it a marriage from the roots of the European culture. Sorry, I love that song from Lady Gaga, Born This Way, but <laughs> on the other case, I don't accept her point of view. If my son or your son or daughter walked in your house holding the hand of another girl, what mm -hmm. would you do? If you can live in a kind of next level friendship but a lower level of marriage what can i do you have the right to choose your path i have responsibility until my death for them it doesn't matter if we have uh, same values or not the same values you're a good dad <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much helen and what was the other topic the Im immigrants yeah the immigrants yeah okay. the refugees the immigrants i don't really have problem migration when migrants are able to accept the local culture and they are not going to build uh, parallel states they're not going to, yeah. to the local values they are bringing their own and i yeah, think i know what you mean problem. i enjoyed it very much and i can imagine that in the future we can talk again like of course anytime oh. bye bye, -bye. And we now have the pleasure to welcome both Helen and Peter. Hi, Helen. Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> Peter. Hi, welcome. Peter, Hi. what did it feel like to talk to a complete stranger? Well, as a teacher, it happens uh, with me each and every September. But OK, <laughs> take the joke away. Um, it was very interesting. I mean, I, I really um, waited uh, for for that meeting. It was very okay. Uh, it was like you know, going abroad without moving. Okay, that sounds nice, Helen. What about you? Um, did you enjoy the discussion? Of course, I did. Uh, Peter uh, is uh, was, is a very interesting person. He is a, a well-educated person, and, and he he made me in a way uh, want to learn more about my uh, my own country's uh, religious history. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, she's one of the few things I wasn't aware of. And, uh, and this was very good. It was a bit awakening for me. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess Peter is a history teacher, so he must know a lot about uh, Greek culture. Yes. Peter, um, what did surprise you most? For me, uh, the thing is uh, how she's open-minded. So, and and the how heartful she is. She's uh, always smiling, and and you know, she was uh, full with energy and kind of um, vibrating, and it it was very good feeling that um, you know, I, I was able to, to talk to somebody who is uh, who, who who seems like full with. Uh, the joy of li uh, life, yeah. Helen, what about you? Uh, was there something that surprised you about Peter when you first talked? Um, uh, I don't think that I was surprised because uh, I was already told about Peter's ideas and we had uh, some uh, uh, emails uh, sent to each other. Uh, so I knew uh, his, uh, his aspects uh, on matters uh, uh, which we disagreed on. So, well, he was very gentle to me. Um, <laughs> Uh, talking to Peter was, uh, even though we had our disagreements on uh, very serious matters, uh, he was very gentle and open-minded. I think that this was uh, the most important thing. And uh, he was uh, willing to, to listen to my ideas and to, to respect my own opinion, even though it's uh, completely different in a uh, few well, aspects uh, than mine. Peter, in the film you said yeah. we have to open up to the world and change a little bit. So looking back at your um, conversation, do you think it has changed any of your views or ideas? Well, um, my, my views are not changed, but the way who I, um, you know, if I uh, get involved in any uh, discussion, it's changed. Like, you know, I don't want to win uh, the war. I just want to fight in a generous way. You know, it's it's like, um, for me, it's you know, taking responsibility about <clears throat> other peoples. And uh, it is so good that uh, I was able to, to you know, uh, discuss. So my ideas, my... my um, view of life are not changed, but it was so uh, good and it was uh, very, uh, you know, motivating. Uh, it, it's motivated me uh, very much that I, I was able to, to listen to other point of views. And Helen, um, what do you think now that you've talked and met each other? Do you think you will stay in touch? Yes, yes, we have already discussed about this and uh, we are very um, keen on acquiring uh, this uh, whole thing uh, uh -huh. even though uh, our uh, interviews are over we will remain we will stay friends and we will be in touch and Helen, do you think that you might even travel to Hungary? You said you would like to travel abroad, do you think uh, instead of Germany, Hungary could be a place for you? Yes, it is a wish. I wish I, uh, I will be able uh, in the future to travel uh, along all here and to meet Peter in person. Peter, have you actually ever been to Athens to, or to Greece? No, uh, sadly not. I would like to go and I would like to uh, travel in um, Greece and I would like to travel there by train. It will be so big a uh, challenge for me. <laughs> and uh, and my biggest dream is uh, not just going to Greece uh, or Thessaloniki, uh, it's going to Constantinopolis okay. and, 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 and see the old walls of the empire. So I'm yes, in, I'm very interested in the Greek culture. Okay. So I would like to go to nowadays Greece as well. 
That sounds great. So, Helen and Peter, thank you so much for well participating in Europe Talks. Thank you for joining us today. And please let us know whether you will stay in touch and send us some pictures if you well, will be seeing each other at some point. Thank you very much and have a good day. Christmas holiday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So um, those were two of our participants, Sebastian, but there were many more. And maybe you could tell us a bit about who actually participated and where they came from. Absolutely. I think train, tip, train trip to Athens sounds wonderful, by the way. So it wasn't just the two of them, obviously, who signed up to Europe Talks this year. We had in total more than 10,000 participants, um, and they came from 37 different countries, which I believe is a new record for Europe Talks. We had 22 media partners in total, and out of those 10,000 people who signed up, and we can see this now, 71% were men, 27% were women, 2% were non-binary. Regarding the questions that we asked, they were all yes and no questions. Um, they agreed very much on one of them, and that was, should same-sex marriages be recognized in all European countries, where 85% said yes, and they also agreed that the EU does, in fact, improve the life of its citizens. 81% answered that question with yes. Is Europe to depend on Russian energy was another one where they tended to agree. 78% said yes. But there was also obviously some strong disagreement with some of the questions. One of them was, should the coronavirus vaccination be mandatory in the EU? Where 48% said no. And should domestic flights be banned in all European countries? 57% said no. And perhaps um, before I hand back to Hannah, this is a good opportunity to say if you want to participate in Europe Talks and have a conversation like Helen and Peter did, you can go to europetalks.org today and sign up. We will be doing um, another round of matching, introducing people to one another after today. And with that, uh, back to you, Hannah. Thank you, Sebastian. Very sadly, Great Britain has left the EU for already some time now. But the good thing is that the media partners from Great Britain are still a part of Europe Talks for the second time this year. And together with the Goethe Institute in London, they have asked 12 people to come to the Goethe Institute to sit on a very special artwork and have a discussion about Brexit. Among them are both Remainers and Brexiteers, and they all have a very personal and emotional story to tell about Brexit. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion, and I'm handing over to Ross and Katharina, who are in London. Thanks, Berlin, and hello from London. I'm very excited to be, be, being part of this finale of the Europe Talks here in London. And we are here in the library of the Goethe Institute in South Kensington on famous Exhibition Road. And I'm very excited to tell you a little, little more about this space. But first, I want to hand over to my partner here, Ross, from the Daily Mirror. Uh, the Daily Mirror and The Express are two of the most diametrically opposed newspapers in the UK. Uh, the Mirror supported Remain, The Daily Express supported Brexit. But we know uh, that uh, this disagreement is paralysing our politics and we have to find a way to communicate better with each other. So that's why we're really proud to be part of Europe Talks for the second year running and why we're really happy to be at the Goethe Institute today um, and involving ourselves with the Seat 12 artwork. Um, as Goethe himself said, um, with knowledge, doubt increases. What a wonderful quote. <laughs> well, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about this artwork here, what you can see. It's Seat number 12 by German artist Jenny Brockman. And it's very, very exciting because Jenny always works not only with material, her, her art also works only when there are people involved. And I would like to quote her. Seat number 12 creates a seating opportunity for 12 people, referring to a circular conference table layout. The construction touches the floor in only one place, meaning that the 12 aluminium branches, which start in the middle and each conclude with a seat cushion, create dangerous tipping motions as soon as one tries to sit down. The interrelatedness between participants, their communication and unwillingness 
to reposition for a collective balance become part of the installation. The seemingly futuristic object deals with communication, a voiced or perhaps merely sensed discourse on the perfect balance inevitably evolves between those seated. So we are very excited now when we have our discussant coming to this seat and trying to balance out their discussion. Once they're seated, they will be part of the artwork. They will be an artwork themselves. So I'm really curious what will happen. Me too. Please choose your seat, but please be careful. Don't you have to negotiate with somebody, with the, with all of you. So please find your view of this. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm, I'm judging from appearance. I'm judging from what I see in the mirror. Do you want to maybe first Thomas? Shall we try to sit? Yes, and then. I think we'll set the same time. Tom's not that one, you've got to sit there. Can you next to me? I think you should sit there, and you, because you know, we're kind of the same size and shape. And yeah. Yeah. Was there a balance? I think so. I think so. That's what I'm guessing. It's actually the balance. Somebody has to be a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe, maybe you should be sitting opposite. Well, should we just try first? You know what I mean? Just yeah. let's try and see if you're guessing here. I don't know. <laughs> so um, we're here to discuss, hopefully in a slightly different way, as this subject has been aired for quite several years uh, at this point, was Brexit worth it? So hi everyone, I'm Sadia Barber. Um, I voted Brexit when the EU started as a project. There was about six countries who went on to 12 and by the end of it was 27. Um, and like any anyone who's got to sell their own business, you know, you can have rules and regulations at the start as a startup. But as you grow and expand, you need the time to go back and reevaluate and see, are they still applicable? And I just felt that that wasn't happening. I voted to remain in the uh, referendum. I do think Brexit was a mistake. I don't think it's going too well. Um, I think when we look at the empty shelves, we were never told that you know these things would be in short demand. That wasn't part of the kind of Brexit story. It's a philosophical mistake for me to close uh, doors to erect borders where there used to be none. And this is particularly because I'm from South Asia, which has suffered from from the problem of borders. It took me 10 minutes at the polling station to vote for Brexit, even though I'd obviously been campaigning for it with the Daily Express throughout the referendum. But now it would take me two seconds to vote for Brexit. Everything I've seen, but of course there will be bumps in the road. Change always brings bumps in the road. But for me, and the attraction of Brexit was not as has been portrayed, to throw up borders. It was actually to open up to the rest of the world, and we're seeing that with the trade deals, with reaching out to India, back to uh, places like Australia and New Zealand already, South America. I'm so, David, sorry, you were, you, 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 know, you were talking about this perceived dichotomy between um, being in Europe and looking out to the rest of the world, and when you were enumerating the countries that Britain was now reaching out to, there was a telling slip when you said we are looking back to Australia, and you mentioned India. And for me, this is really quite a dangerous way of replicating an imperial vision. Well, I also mentioned Brazil. Those first two already made me understand that you're, there's a subconscious driver of imperialism, you know, uh, the greatness of empire that was once lost. I don't see why relations with Brazil and Chile, etc., cannot continue while remaining part of the EU. Within that mix, to single out the so-called Commonwealth nations, for me, betrays another element in the underlying desire for Brexit, which for me is dangerous. Sorry, can I just step in there? I kind of listened to what David said. 
I didn't pick up any of the imperialism. It was the fact that actually there were so many restrictions in terms of preference. You know, your default has to be to Europe, whether it's for um, kind of employment, whether it's for trade, etc., before you can start going elsewhere. We don't have those infringements now. For starters, um, I have an Italian connection as well, funnily enough. My wife is Italian. That's one of the reasons it took me 10 minutes to actually work out how I was going to vote. This, this nonsense, I'm afraid, about saying that we all want to return to the British Empire. The European Union is a fortress. It has a thing called the Customs Union, which stopped us from having trade deals, proper trade deals, with other countries. It stopped us from having immigration deals with other countries. People in this country don't want to be part of a conglomeration of nation states with a dictatorial element. I mean, we saw how they treated Greece. We see how they treat the African migrants that are trying to cross the channel. I wouldn't want to be part of a, an organisation that is like that. And I think with a progressive government, um, we could have got a more bespoke deal where we could have had an inclusive Brexit where it would have worked for European people and British people and we can effectively allocate our resources. I don't think it's one or the other. I think both can exist, but I think people are misdirecting their anger at people who have nothing to do with the situation of the UK and I think that is the problem. Uh, David, actually, the, one of the mo most attractive aspects of Britain is its soft power. As a, as a hard power, it's, it's not on the same level as Americans, for example. As a soft power, it is absolutely universally praised as the most attractive country, starting with the language, starting with its culture, pop culture, music, history, Shakespeare, and so forth. That is a predominant reason why the Germans are so unhappy about Brexit, because they love Britain sometimes more than some of the Brexiteers love their own country. We, we, we feel akin to, to this uh, attractiveness, and we've, we thrive on, on British things. German television would be nothing without BBC input and other English language programs and so forth. And so uh, it is not the empire which Britain looks back to. It's, it's the sovereign idea. Sovereignty has acquired an importance which is beyond its real value. As I said about China, Germany's trade with China. We are a sovereign nation, although enmeshed in the EU, and we have sovereign economic development with China. It Yes, it may be slower than if you do these trade deals or your, yourself, but it's not prohibiting it. We can be both a member of the EU and develop healthy economic relations. Can I just say that um, I was noticing that John was looking very depressed in this um, conversation, I just, I mean, and I was wondering I just, what's I, the... I don't see the value in these... In these. That there are so, there that are the so many factual... No, there are so many the... factual inaccuracies. If you want, you, you take an hour to unpick them all. There was a brief moment around the millennium when I dared to, ho to hope that this country was going to start, for the first time, understanding that it's rooted in common values. I also don't respect Remainers who try to convince me that actually it'll all be fine. When Brexit happened, oh, don't worry, it'll be a sort of soft Brexit, it'll be a good Brexit all the antagonisms would go away. Britain wouldn't be this sort of country where you sort of sit in the bathtub waving your flag and singing Rule Britannia. It would be a different open country. None of this has come to pass. But frankly, if that's what people want, I'm part of the older generation. And if that's what you younger generation, because the older generation is much less relevant now, if that's genuinely what you want for your country, where you see French people busking in Portugal, doing graffiti art in Sweden. That's, to me, lovely. That's brilliant. Can I, can I say something? OK, so um, I don't understand what really is the problem. I don't think any of those things you've highlighted are going to change, as in, you know, the Britain you described. OK, so I don't understand what the issue is. Things change and things need to change, don't they? Everybody's talking about their own reality here. I'm homeless. OK, now I'm homeless. All right, so, so the fact that we are not in the EU, EU, for me, hopefully, means things were going to get better. Means that hopefully, because, you know, this was this doomsday, that basically they we're all going to be leaving on the boats and planes and they were all going... That's not true. Because if you come where I live, every single, single city council property that becomes available goes to an EU citizen. Why is just, that? Why, sorry, why is that? Surely. I know that John is a city councillor in Manchester where we have a lot of these issues and maybe John 
What do you think the reason is that people can't get on the housing yeah. list? We're not building any council housing. Can I just ask you, how much is the housing shortage in Manchester, from your experience, due to uh, Britain's membership of the European Union? It, well, you know, EU citizens aren't at the top of the list in Manchester. I, I don't know if it's the case in Nottingham. I, I genuinely don't know. But in Manchester, that's not the case. It's obviously veterans, it's uh, families, it's, it's people who are vulnerable. Um, those are the people that are at the top of the list. It's not based on your nationality or anything like that. I'm vulnerable. I Aren't, I'm vulnerable being homeless. How is that the fault of the European Union? That I'm not saying it's the fault. And if I said it was the fault, I said it's part of the issue, didn't I? I think, I think, I think Giselle's main well, point is it's about resource. It's of like kind of, it's managing. Mean, so mean, when you're not part of the kind of EU and you're that you can manage the resource, so it's about headcount. But people need to get a hold of themselves and sort themselves out. You can't blame the government. You can't blame Tom, Dick or Harry. People need to have a bit of dignity and pride in themselves. Look for a job. All right, but no jobs are not easy to come by. But they have to... They, you can't be spoon-fed all the time and people rely too much on benefits instead of sorting themselves out. Because, because I agree. We Brexiteers need to stop blaming Europe for everything. But also, actually, Remainers need to stop blaming Brexit for everything. And actually, the one thing I really liked about Brexit was actually we could stop blaming the Europeans. We could stop having our governments and civil servants saying, well, it's the EU. We would do it, but it's the EU. Now it's up to them. And they've got to deliver. Right. Now you're out of the EU. You have only yourself to blame if things don't succeed. You really have to make the most of it out of your own current affairs and no longer to blame anything on anyone else. Well, that is people, a... I think people in general should stop blaming everybody else mm. and talk to one another. So I just wanted to ask one question from you about how do you think people in Poland have viewed Brexit? From, from, from the people I know, um, well, I guess for a lot of Polish people took this as an opportunity to come back because they just didn't feel welcome anymore. So that's, I guess, the emotional side. And the other side is, of course, also the economical one and just the lack of security. Am I allowed to stay? Should I buy a house here? Will I be able to live here in five years? Um, so I guess, I mean, that's what we are seeing as well, right? Just many people left because just they didn't feel like they have a future here. Do you think Poland will leave the EU? I hope they won't. I really hope they won't. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? But maybe we've learned from Burton. In that way, maybe it's a good thing we've learned. Any ideas about how we can talk to each other better? Yeah, I mean, just looking um, around or, or listening around to what people have been saying, a lot of people have described themselves as um, patriotic, loving the country, and that's all similarities that I think we, a lot of us have. I certainly want to believe in Britain, and I'm, I love my country. Uh, you know, I identify as a as a Manc, a Briton, and then a, a European. And so we will work with um, every single community, regional, national government to make sure that um, we succeed as a country. I remember when COVID kicked off, we live in a development in which there is social housing and we were aware that there were a lot of our neighbours who had been made redundant, didn't have jobs, were really scrambling. So we thought, OK, since we can't do the big policies we do with our families and kind of think, let's use that funding and actually have a nice Saturday meal. And I put a Facebook post on, just said, look, you know, if anyone could help. And all I was looking was for chefs and cooks to help me do the cooking. And actually, I was inundated with so much money that I didn't know what to do with it. And this is from Indians, from English people, from Catholics, from Jews. It showed that when we work together, we work really well. And that is what we have to remember, the things that we have in common. And that is the Britain I want my kids to live in and be proud of, that you can be Pakistani, you can be British, and you can be a European. Just because I'm not in the EU, you know, I'm still part of Europe, and I'm still a citizen that's actively contributing. And that is what we should be proud of, the common human values that we have. Thank you. I'm just going to, I'm going to bring that to a close. We're now, we're going to exit the artwork and I'll let you lead that. I'll just... We all have to get up again. We have to Thank you to everyone for such a lively and well-balanced discussion. Uh, you are all great artists and thanks so much from the Daily Mirror and the Daily Express for including us in this year's Europe Talks. Thank you, Russ. And thank you, Europe, for listening and keep on talking. Auf Wiedersehen aus London and I hand back to Berlin.
Thank you so much, Ross. Uh, thank you so much, Goethe uh, Institute in London, for this contribution to this uh, event today. I think they had a wonderful discussion that touched on many aspects that are present uh, in the national debates taking place all over Europe. Um, and we're now going from the UK um, to a country that was mentioned actually in their discussion. We're going to Poland. In Poland, um, we will have a contribution um, by Bart Staszewski. Bart is an activist and filmmaker whose work for the LGBTI plus community has been internationally recognized. He grew up in East Poland and is one of the organizers of the Equality March in his hometown of Lublin. And his documentary titled Article 18 is considered one of the most important films of the LGBT equality movement in Poland. We're really happy to have him on the program today, and he's going to be talking to Julia from the Goethe Institute in Warsaw. Thanks, Berlin, and Jen Dobre from Warsaw, everybody. We are very delighted to uh, participate in the final event of the project Europe Talks 2021 and contribute with an interview with Bart Staszewski who is a very well-known Polish LGBTQI plus activist and documentarist. Bart, a very warm welcome at the premises of the Goethe Institute here. We are very happy that you found the time to be with us tonight. Thank you for hosting me. I have a question uh, right away. What rights do LGBTQI people in Poland have? Oh, actually, we uh, don't have them, actually. When we count them, we can think about the... Uh, trans people having some kind of rights, but they need to create a lawsuit against their own parents if they want to change the legal document they have during the transition process they have. But on, or on the daily basis, we don't have the civil unions, we don't have the marriage equality, or nor we have uh, the hate speech law. Uh, so we are not protected by a state, uh, which is, I think, the, the most horrible thing. Um, so on the very daily basis, we are in the constant danger. Of course, if somebody will beat in us or if some very big danger will happen to us, we can be protected by the other different articles in the criminal law. Uh, but the, the, the worst thing which is happening actually on the very daily basis is the hate speech, which is constant thing in the, in the Polish TV, Polish politics. Uh, being everywhere visible. When you look back the last, let's say, the recent 30 years, what changes took place in Poland? When I think about the last 30 years, I think about uh, Polish solidarity movement, Polish transformation process, and that uh, there was a very good opportunity to create the first step to the equality, which well, could be the civil unions. But accidentally, uh, the left-wing party, we could say, sold this subject to the church when they were going into the European Union for, uh, for the church who was not opposing Poland going uh, to the European Union, being part of it. So the uh, last 30 years was the building the infrastructure rebuilding Poland, but we forgot about those basic human rights. And now it's much more, uh, much more harder to do anything about this. Uh, I, I created a documentary about this uh, in 2016, Article 18, uh, because Article 18 is also the name of the, uh, the, the article from the Polish Constitution that says that marriage is a union between the men and women, and so is protected by a state. Dot, nothing else. Uh, so we could have at least the civil unions, but for many politicians it was used as an excuse in the debate for the LGBT rights that we cannot do anything because we have a Polish constitution, blah, blah, blah. And so it was always a problem for them to create any kind of change. I remember the Donald Tusk telling that uh, this is not the time for the uh, viewpoint debate. Uh, it's not a time for such a thing. When it was uh, another civil, civil union bill in the parliament which was dropped, uh, draft bill. So it was always not a time for civil unions or the March equality or the hate speech law. So 30 years, but of course the, we, we should mention that there was the LGBT movement there. Mm -hmm. We was creating, uh, good, going forward, we was educating the people. At least the government was not opposing to do t those things. Uh, maybe we wasn't uh, supported by them too much, but we was not uh, in a danger or uh, there was no problems made for us. So everything changed in 2015. 
Yeah, let's concentrate maybe on uh, the last five years um, since uh, the new government uh, took over uh, power in Poland. What um, what changes? Because what I understand from you is that especially these last uh, five years um, made life um, much more complicated um, for the LGBTQI communities uh, in Poland. And what what happened in these last five, six years? When the Polish nationalistic right-wing government came into power, so long justice, peace, um, we could say that everything has changed uh, because we started to be the Polish enemy. Uh, they called us as an enemy in the debate. They called us that we are a threat to the Polish lifestyle. We are their foreign, foreign agenda uh, that can implicate uh, the Polish uh, families. Uh, and so we could see how it slowly, so, so this hate speech slowly increased in the debate where the top politicians started to use the hate language against us when the public TV has been used as a tool against the my minorities, uh, my minority. So uh, this was the horrible thing. And then the whole plan of this LGBT freezone started where the first municipalities in 2019 started to declare the fight uh, with the LGBT people, calling them for the LGBT ideology. Their visibility became a threat, so we should get back to the, to the closet. And so uh, the 2019 was the worst, I think, year ever, because even in the communism era, it was never pronounced by the government as a public enemy, and it changed in 2019, because the public uh, figures, the prime minister, the president during his election time, calling us, for, uh, us not for human, but for, uh, for an ideology, uh, and the other politicians from the ruling party. It became the worst year ever. We became, I was feeling myself that we are second category citizens because we cannot do anything. Those are, those old people are against us. Uh, those are creating those zones free from humanity, we could say, quoting Ursula von der Leyen. And this was the, be the worst thing ever. And, but on the other hand, we seen the Polish Stonewall, how we was uprising, how we, how we was uh, creating the, the highest number of the Pride Paris through whole Poland in the small and big cities, which was fantastic. And we see the Polish uh, grassroots society is increasing. And we see that uh, young people don't want to just uh, watch the situation. They want to be a part of the change. They want to be a change. And this is the good thing about this. The Polish nation is a bit like the more we are pushing, the more people are responding to what the situation is. Uh, and this is what we are looking to. I think that we have a very bad situation, but on the other hand, young people are going, protesting, being involved into the climate movement, being involved into the uh, equality movement. This is the good part of it. I think um, from observing um, the society, um, I myself haven't been a long time in Poland now. We are not uh, just for coincidence sitting uh, here um, in the exhibition that the Goethe Institute has at the moment, Queer as German Folk, which also sheds a light uh, on um, the Stonewall movement in Eastern and Western Germany. Um, but um, maybe it's um, maybe you would agree um, to answer if we ask you or if I ask you a more personal question because you are basically riding a tech every day. So how does the life of an activist uh, look like? Mm -hmm. Your everyday life, it must be quite exhausting, isn't it? Oh, it is actual because you feel that your own country is against you, that the Polish leaders are against you. I remember just two weeks ago, the Polish president in the interview for Latinian TV calls me for the most radical and the most aggressive activist in Poland. So it's an equal battle. But when the president of Poland is calling you like that, when the prime minister one year ago uh, is telling that I am the fake news maker, which is also the threat, and the Polish ministries like Czarnek is telling that I am the, the, the chief neo-Marxist ideologist, the uh, chairman. Uh, so this, those things can be funny sometimes, but on the other hand, the, the hatred came to you. Uh, every time the public TV is uh, screening something about me or the LGBT movement, 
I got many threats by the internet, which I usually uh, go with them to the police and I just make a compliment, uh, which usually d doesn't mean anything because they are anonymous. So uh, LGBT activists are under the constant threat. I'm not the only one. On the other hand, we got the lawsuits, politically motiv motivated lawsuits, so slaps. Uh, are the daily basis, daily bread for the activists. I got free lawsuits from the municipalities represented by the Connected to Government uh, Anti-Defamation League with Maciej Świerski and the top leader of, of them. Uh, and my fellow friends from the Atlas of Hate who created a map, virtual map of Poland with the LGBT free zones over there. Uh, they collected all of them. They, they got seven lawsuits uh, by, from the municipalities represented by the Ordo Juris. So we see how those right-wing uh, NGOs are involved into this battle with the LGBT activists uh, and how much it's politically motivated. So it's not just about my mood, how I'm feeling, but also the legal consequences, uh, the intimidation which is constant, and on the other hand, of course, uh, the signal to all other, the chilling effect, that if you will go the same steps, the same path, you can pay con big consequences. Is there anything, or what, what would you say, is there anything EU politicians or EU activists um, may do to support um, your projects, to support other uh, activists group uh, in Poland mm -hmm. fighting for rights for the LGBTQI communities? I think that one of those things can be, of course, fighting with the slaps, so those politically motivated lawsuits, uh, which this debate already started in the European Parliament. On the other hand, fighting with those LGBT free zones, which, is, which are happening in Poland, less and less of them, more of them is now uh, withdrawing, and this is a good thing. On the other hand, I think that we need to decide if this union is the union of equality, uh, some uh, values, or is it just a, a union of policies? So uh, this is the big uh, question for the next years. But I think that slowly European Union is going in the, the good direction. Creating equality strategy uh, is one of those things. But I'm just hoping that there will be more of those signals, more of those things, because if the European Union will close the eyes on what is happening in Poland, Hungary and other countries, of course, we, there is no future in front of the European Union. Maybe um, you can give us an example of upcoming <laughs> projects uh, of yours. What are you doing at the moment uh, in order to uh, shape the future? I am focusing about uh, visibility of the LGBT people and our rights and our problems. So this is the things that I will underline in next year. And of course, I'm also thinking about the election time, that we should have the Polish LGBT people agenda in the parliament, how we can support those LGBT future politicians like they are doing in the United States, the Victory Funds uh, and other initiatives which are over there are supporting LGBT people to make a change. We, just, we need to be in the part of the debate, we just uh, can think about this. This is the thing I am futuring, f thinking. Uh, how we can do it is the big question, but we should focus already on those topics. Bart, thank you very much uh, for coming here uh, to us today and sharing your valuable time, your thoughts with us and the audience. I give back to Berlin now. Thank you, Julia, and thank you very much, Bart, for those very, well, worrying but also impressive insights uh, on the current situation in Poland. We would also like to thank um, our media partners in Poland, Gazeta Wyborska, who have been there from the very start of Europe Talks. Um, they are now joining for the third time. And we are glad that they're still doing so because we know that their political, well, their situation in Poland as a media outlet is not the easiest. We have also asked um, several questions about climate change in this year's edition of Europe Talks. And we would now like to move to the question of climate and what we need to do um, considering the situation we're all facing at the moment. We asked, for example, whether fossil fuel cars should be banned by 2030 or whether domestic flights should be banned at all. Antje Boetius, who is a German marine biologist and a professor at the University of Bremen, has a very firm position on how to tackle climate change. She has participated in about 40 marine biology expeditions and advocates for very 
well, strong tightening of climate protection. She has also recently been at the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow, and those impressions will also feed into the following talk of her. My name is Antje Boetius, and I'm a deep sea researcher and marine biologist and the director of Europe's largest polar and marine research institute, the Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven, Germany. I can say that my own and our scientific observations and simulations of climate and the Earth system, especially with regard to polar and ocean dynamics in response to climate change, are truly alarming. Not only do we lose Arctic sea ice at a rate of 13% per decade, we predicted ice-free summers as early as 10 to 20 years from now. We also witness a rapid melt of permafrost with huge methane releases. We witness ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica melting, raising the sea level. We observe how this affects marine and polar life and us across the world. The coastal ecosystem especially are under massive change. The North Sea has already warmed by two degrees and the cold winters are messing, causing a massive, massive change in species distribution. But altogether, our scientific data also show that as humanity, we can still change the path we're on, but only if we act now and together. And there's hope already the emissions are stalling for some years. But it's not enough. So to me, the European Green Deal and its climate package shows a way forward as it will initiate cross-sector collaborations in energy supplies and infrastructures to become greenhouse gas neutral before mid-century. This is needed to reach the 1.5 degrees warming goal. We need a framework that is more just so that polluting the atmosphere and oceans with greenhouse gases will be much more expensive and that switching to green energy will be more affordable to everyone. We will need to thrive for a better quality for life, for sustainable production, transport, and thereby also new jobs. On what does this picture of a good future depend? All of this depends on more, not less collaboration and innovative solutions beyond borders, including Europe's borders. The spirit that we need is exactly that. We are one humanity and we have only one planet and this planet could be much better with us working together and working with nature. And you know, this spirit was present at the Glasgow conference. And I was really moved by the urgency and ambition voiced in so many speeches of people there. Because I have researched on the role of methane for decades, I really appreciate that now we have a package for urgent action to reduce methane emissions. And also one to end deforestation to protect wetlands. I have listened to and talked to some of the people who are negotiators at climate conferences since many years. And most of them are patient, full of confidence and hope that each step taken matters. International conventions and the negotiations, conferences where we meet are needed to build a framework for keeping the 1.5 climate goal in sight and in reach. And this is why I don't understand that so many haters are out there for that climate conference. It has moved us closer for a framework to this ultimate goal, especially with the new pledges of India, China and the US. But as citizens of Europe, we also carry a larger responsibility than ever because it's urgent now to become climate neutral before mid-century. We need to move really fast. We need to get rid of coal as energy source and of fossil carbon subventions because they're unfair to the future generations. We need to build the infrastructures to allow our citizens to live greenhouse gas neutral. And really, we have to show solidarity with those who are so much affected by the climate crisis already today and have neither emitted the CO2 nor achieved the wealth and security and jobs that we have because of the use of coal, oil and gas. In this regard, I must say that I'm sad that at Glasgow we could not reach the 100 billion climate fund that was promised to the lesser developed states. And I truly hope that we can now make a difference for the future and be very frank about this need for solidarity, help, support for more innovation and education across the world. You know, me as oceanographer, I can only say 
we are all in the same boat and we need strong winds to sail to that future we want. Thank you, Antje Bötzius. And uh, on a personal note, it was good to see her again. I was actually one of her students uh, 15 years ago at uh, university. Um, for those of you who've just joined the live stream, we've been on air for about an hour already. Um, a quick recap on what it is that you're watching. Uh, this is the final event of Europe Talks uh, 2021. For the past couple of weeks and today, thousands of people from 37 different European countries have been meeting and will be meeting in one-on-one -on -one conversations to discuss uh, political questions that they strongly disagree about. And climate change, as we just heard, um, was one of the topics that, have been, that has been hotly debated over um, the last couple of weeks in Europe Talks 2021. To make it all possible, we've been working with uh, 22 media partners in different countries. And for the very first time, we actually had media partners in Spain, um, which we were really excited about. So now we're going to Madrid to see a discussion between the Spanish journalist and editor-in-chief Ana Pastor from Neutral and Nacho Cadero, the director of the Spanish newspaper El Confidencial. They will be quickly introduced by the director of the Goethe Institute in Madrid and the German F ambassador in Spain, Wolfgang Dold. Their discussion will be followed by a brief musical interlude by Micro Teatro Madrid. Bienvenidos al Goethe Institute. A mí me alegro mucho que hoy día tenemos un formato muy interesante, Europe Talks, un formato iniciado por Zeit Online. Es un debate en el que la primera vez España está participando, un debate que va a tocar la fibra sensitiva de los grandes temas sociales y políticos. Estamos aquí en un lugar, el Goethe Institute, un lugar donde se encuentran las artes y el debate, y así es un lugar perfecto por ese formato. Que disfruten el evento. Una cálida bienvenida desde Madrid, también desde la Embajada de Alemania. Mi país de acogida a España es profundamente pro-europeo. Eso es lo que dicen todas las encuestas, y así lo he vivido en los últimos tres años. Un país que, como Alemania, por su propia historia, aprecia y defiende especialmente la idea de paz democrática de la UE, no debería estar ausente de un proyecto como Europe Talks que recoge las diferentes voces de la Unión. Por ello, nos alegramos mucho de que España participe este año por primera vez en Europe Talks y además con dos representantes de tanto renombre como el Confidencial y Neutral, a quienes quiero agradecer una vez más su compromiso europeo. Por último, también quiero felicitar a todos los que han participado en Europe Talks. Siento el mayor de los respetos por lo que significa salir de tu zona de confort, de tu burbuja, y enfrentarte a una opinión diferente, contraria, a menudo incluso incómoda, que en la mayoría de los casos, además, consideras completamente equivocada. Realmente tienes que ser capaz de soportar, soportar eso, y de hecho todos deberíamos ser capaces de soportarlo porque precisamente de eso viven nuestras democracias europeas y la UE, de un intercambio franco de opiniones y puntos de vista y de la voluntad de comprometerse con los demás y llegar a resultados comunes. Y en este sentido, espero que todos disfruten de la aportación de Madrid que empiece ahora con una versión propia de Europe Talks, con expectación Estoy esperando oír los puntos de vista de Ana Pastor, de Neutral, y de Nacho Cardero, del Confidencial, sobre algunas de las cuestiones planteadas por Europe Talks. Bueno, Cardero, vamos a hablar de los grandes retos para Europa, Europe Talks, y de algunas de las cuestiones más importantes que tendríamos que seguramente incidir más los medios sobre la mesa, al margen de la pandemia, que ya ha puesto 
en tensión al continente, yo creo que el cambio climático seguramente será por orden de importancia una de ellas. ¿no? Bueno, yo estoy convencido que sí. Y, y bueno, estar aquí hablando de Europa contigo es un placer, a, eh, Ana, y de, los, de la iniciativa hasta que, que hemos puesto en marcha y que sirve pues para puntos de vista en común y llevar a pactos y llegar a acuerdos y tal, pues creo que es muy importante. Y, y de los más importantes, yo creo que urge, es el tema del cambio climático, claro. lógicamente, ¿no? Porque es verdad que Europa o es, o es eh, sostenible o realmente pues no vamos a Europa. Lo que pasa es que es verdad que aquí ha habido también mucho ruido, porque efectivamente pues Europa tiene un calendario, tiene un plan, que es eh, acabar pues con los combustibles fósiles, fósiles eh, concretamente con los coches de combustión, pues ha marcado el año 2035 y la verdad es que todos los países se han conjurado para, para ello. Yo creo que ¿Tú hay... lo ves realista? Porque es verdad que el, el calendario se marca en, en un momento de tormenta perfecta, que nos pilla justo en la salida de, del tema de la pandemia y que esto tiene un coste económico, evidente. Pues yo, yo creo que tú, Ana, que además tratas estos temas a diario, crees que lo estás viendo que realista del todo no es. Mm. Es voluntarista y creo que es importante establecerse unas, unas, unas fechas en el calendario, ¿no? Pero está claro que después la cruda realidad es muy distinta. Aquí cuando preguntamos en Europe Talks qué pensaban nuestros lectores, o, eh, pues ya, ya los resultados son que el, prácticamente dos terceras partes están digamos, a favor de que se prohíban, por ejemplo, coches contaminantes uh -huh. o que se tomen medidas de algún, de algún punto de vista coercitivas, es decir, que la ley establezca que no se puedan vender coches. ¿no? Y eso para mí está muy bien, que se establezcan calendarios, pues 2035, 2030, algunos tan ambiciosos como Noruega 2025, me parece fenomenal. Pero claro, después llega una crisis energética como la actual uh -huh. y... ¿Y qué pasa? Entonces, yo creo que sí, que hay que marcarse unas metas, pero en ningún momento sin que, sin que sean obligatorios. ¿no? A mí lo de prohibir es, es que... que entonces cuando... no ocurrirá. O sea, ¿tú crees que habría que prohibirlos? No, yo lo que creo es que es un mal momento, uno, dos, no se ha hecho la pedagogía suficiente y tres, a veces pienso que es un debate, como decimos en España, de pijos, de privilegiados, porque es verdad que eh, para quién están destinadas las medidas coercitivas, no todo el mundo puede comprarse un coche eléctrico, aunque los datos dicen que, que en los dos, tres últimos años ha aumentado muchísimo más que, el, que otro tipo de vehículos, pero creo que es un debate de privilegiados y, y que no sé si es el momento ahora mismo de obligar, como dices tú, por ley, ¿no? Efectivamente, yo creo que tiene que, o sea, tiene que haber una transición, que aquí siempre vamos demasiado rápido, tiene que ser una transición ordenada donde se favorezca, como tú dices, a las clases más desfavorecidas o que haya unos incentivos para esta transición energética que incluye pues, los coches y muchas más otras tecnologías, pero tiene que haber una transición ordenada donde los estados pues, ayuden a, a, a los más desfavorecidos, ¿no? porque si no... Uh, lógicamente pues tenemos, pues tenemos problemas sociales y tenemos manifestaciones, eh, lo, lo que estamos viendo todos los días, lo que vamos a ver, el, el malestar social, pues lo vimos en, con los chalecos amarillos en Francia, estamos viendo manifestaciones de los agricultores, estamos viendo aquí en Madrid, en España, manifestaciones de, y muchas de ellas tienen que, tienen que estar relacionadas con la crisis energética, con los problemas que están atravesando y porque muchas veces se ponen unas metas de, de, de que vamos a una determinada tecnología ambiental que es tan ambiciosa que está causando unos graves perjuicios sociales en el corto plazo. Y yo creo que aquí es, se está viendo. Y bueno, y luego que se mezcla también la competencia europea, que debería haber, digamos, algo común, como siempre decimos. Luego hay una competencia local, lógicamente también, de, en las ciudades, ¿no? Estamos viendo Madrid y en otros lugares con el tema eh, de la contaminación. Y, y luego la responsabilidad de las empresas, ¿no? Y yo añadiría quizá una cuarta, que es la nueva economía post-fósil, eh, que obliga de alguna manera a los gobiernos a incentivar y ayudar a empresas que estén haciendo cosas diferentes. El otro día leía que hay una empresa española, una startup, eh, que con los residuos fósiles está convirtiendo el aceite en jabón y está haciendo eh, materias nuevas, digamos, y, y buscando un poco el punto de esa nueva economía. Pero claro, eso también tiene que ser un impulso de los gobiernos, quizá con los fondos europeos. ¿no? Totalmente. Además, tú, tú lo has dicho antes, o sea, hemos dicho Europa tiene que ser sostenible, no ser Europa. Yo creo que todas estas nuevas iniciativas, startups, empresas, pues tienen que ser incentivadas y ayudadas a que prosperen, que Creo que es bueno, de alguna forma, eh, incentivar, subsidiar este tipo de iniciativas, pero lo has comentado, es decir, hay un problema con competencia. Es decir, al final, eh, que a mí me parece todo bien, ¿no? Pero si el, los acuerdos de Glasgow o los, cualquier acuerdo planetario que hagamos del cambio climático, de la sostenibilidad, no lo firman dos grandes potencias como China o como India, o si eso, son más retraídos... A mí eso no me vale como excusa. Eso es verdad que bueno, es una realidad porque son de los que bueno, más... Díselo a estas, empresas, a estas empresas que se esfuerzan tanto por convertir el, el fósil en jabón, dile después que en China, en India, les dan igual y van a producir lo mismo, pero contaminante, pero mucho más barato. Sí, mucho... pero si la tendencia es creciente en el resto 
resto de lugares del mundo, aun siendo dos potencias tan importantes, creo que acaba arrastrándoles un poco a esa ola. Lo cierto es que como no lo es todavía, pues también les cuesta. Pero eh, bueno, desde luego el cambio climático es una de ellas. Eh, hay otra, otra pregunta que hemos lanzado en Europe Talks, que es la renta básica, que no es lo mismo que el ingreso mínimo, si debería haber una renta básica para los ciudadanos europeos en un momento en el que todavía estamos todos muy asustados. ¿Tú qué crees? Fíjate que no, nosotros, eh, Ana, eh, pensamos muy parecido en muchas cosas, pero aquí creo que vamos a... <risa> Aquí creo, bueno, que, a ver, a ver. aquí creo que vamos a chocar, aquí creo que vamos a chocar. Yo, fíjate, yo soy un periodista que empezó con la, con la economía y después derivó mi carrera funestamente hacia la política. ¿no? Pero empecé económico y yo siempre me he perdido mucho porque son muchos conceptos, son muchos países y no todo, para todos los países son los mismos conceptos. Entonces me hago un poco de lío. ¿no? Pero digamos, si eh, por un lado estaría la renta básica, que es una contribución pública de todos los estados a sus ciudadanos por el mero hecho de ser ciudadanos. Sí, decir, al margen de su situación económica, laboral, etc. Ricos, ¿sí? pobres, casados, con familias, sin familias, todos tienen derecho a una asignación. Esto sería la renta, la renta básica, que no hay que confundir con lo que tenemos aquí, el ingreso mínimo vital o una, unas rentas de subsidio para la gente más desfavorecida. ¿vale? Para este ingreso mínimo vital, esta es pequeña ayuda, contribución pública, para sacar a la gente de la pobreza, que es eso, lógicamente sí. ¿Vale? Para lo otro, para lo que es la renta básica, es decir, una, por el mero hecho de ser ciudadano, tener una contribución, recibir un, un dinero público, creo que no. ¿Vale? No, no estamos tan alejados de ah, la también. posición. Ah. No, yo, so, yo sobre que... todo porque vuelvo al momento, vuelvo al, al punto en el que nos encontramos ahora. Creo que es mucho mejor hacer bien el ingreso mínimo, porque además no hablamos de gente eh, solo que no tenga opciones laborales, es que son trabajadores pobres a los que su renta de trabajo no les está llegando para mantener, por ejemplo, una familia. Y esto se hace en muchos países de Europa. Aquí el hándicap está siendo que al ser un país descentralizado se una, ¿no? Pero, pero creo que el momento es hacer bien el ingreso mínimo y empezar por los de abajo, no por lo general ¿no? de la población. De hecho, no hay muchos lugares en el mundo donde esa renta se esté practicando. ¿no? Y de hecho, en, en otros países europeos, y eh, nuestros compañeros saben, pues han fracasado ¿no? este tipo de iniciativas. Aquí está costando, como bien sabes, mucho llevarla a la práctica, nos están favoreciendo todos y al final pues están, hay un cierto malestar porque a quien tenía que llegar pues no está llegando. ¿no? Pero creo que en el fondo, si es una buena idea lo del ingreso, ingreso mínimo vital, pues porque eh, siempre lo va a ser y cuando llega una crisis como la del 2008 y después una crisis como la del COVID y ves que, el, que la gente pues lo está pasando muy mal, pues creo que es necesario bueno, pues para, para que salgan adelante. ¿no? De lo de la renta básica, pues no, no, a mí siempre yo que no, no, no soy liberal, aunque tampoco sé muy bien lo que es ser liberal, ¿no? pero a mí estos subsidios gratuitos a gente que, que puede estar trabajando sin trabajar... Eh, que desincentiva Eso no suele ocurrir, ¿eh? Todo, casi todos los estudios demuestran que no hay un de, no se desincentiva por lo general, o siempre habrá sí, casos pero, que pero, sí. Pero ya, no, ya es simplemente el concepto, el fondo, es decir, tú vas a recibir un dinero aunque tengas posibilidad de trabajar y no trabajes. Ya, pero fíjate, a un nórdico nunca le diríamos lo de la paguita. No te imaginas que un nórdico prefiera estar en casa por el hecho de tener esa renta. Y sin embargo en España siempre tendemos como a menospreciarlo ¿no? con esa expresión tan denostada, ¿no? Sí, bueno, yo quizás por nuestra cultura mediterránea, yo siempre tengo la noción de que aquí utilizaría muchos la renta básica para vivir un poco de, del bote. Pero no lo pensaríamos de otros ciudadanos europeos, bueno, seguramente. Eh, en, sí, seguramente no por la mentalidad, pero en otros países nórdicos, que siempre aquí se nos también hablamos mucho de los países nórdicos como la panacea, sí. tienen problemas como nosotros, ¿eh? claro, en todos los sí, sentidos. Sí, sí. Y, y las rentas básicas que han tenido esa cada uno, o rentas básicas mixtas, uh -huh. tampoco es que hayan tenido un éxito desbordante. ¿eh? O sea que... ¿Algún tipo de renta? Sí, pero con unos criterios y con cierta coherencia y sentido común. Sí, con control posterior, ¿no?, de que se está haciendo bien. Bueno, un, un tema más que en este yo sí lo tengo muy Estamos claro. Estamos arreglando Europa ya, Estamos... ya, ya, ya <risa> hemos arreglado Europa. Eh, hay... como esta y este ya. lo tengo clarísimo. Tiene que ver con la acogida eh, de refugiados. Hay cierta confusión siempre de refugiados, inmigrantes, el asilo, etcétera. Pero yo lo tengo muy claro. El gran debate es si tenemos que cumplir, por lo menos lo que nos hemos comprometido a cumplir, que son las cuotas que ya venían de, de la crisis de refugiados de Siria, que ya nos parecía que teníamos que aprender algo con Siria y con Afganistán hemos visto que no mucho. Y en cualquier caso el debate es social, porque hay gobernantes como Merkel que hicieron una apuesta de, de empatía ¿no? hacia gente que lo está pasando mal y tuvo un castigo en las urnas. Entonces es verdad que le tenemos que exigir también a la política que sea valiente si tú estás de acuerdo con que hay que hacer acogida. Pues eh, ahora me cuentas tú. O sea, yo por supuesto estoy a, a favor de que se hagan eh, planes de asilo y acogida, lógicamente, ¿no? Esa es la grandeza de Europa, o debería ser la grandeza de Europa. Fíjate, cuando hablas de Merkel, y aquí estamos en un buen sitio para hablar de Merkel, yo creo que al principio fueron muy positivos y se aplaudió la iniciativa de acoger a los sirios después fue criticada por lo mismo sin embargo el medio y largo plazo parece que está dando la razón a Merkel ¿vale? porque hay cierta integración la sociedad empieza a ver que ha habido cierta integración y además 
positiva, ¿no? a lo que tiene que tender Europa, es decir, a un cierto plan de asilo con cierta coherencia y que, exista, que esté programado, ¿no? porque eh, yo creo que los precedentes, como decías, de Siria y algún otro reciente que hemos visto, pues es bastante desagradable y dice bastante poco de, de Europa y del estado de bienestar. ¿no? Y es, Europa es un, es un continente que es sabio, pero que es viejo y que tiene mucha deuda. Y, y, y que necesita inmigración y esto lo tenemos que... que... Además desde los dos puntos de vista, yo siempre planteo desde el punto de vista que decíamos de la empatía ¿no? de, de a cualquier país y a cualquier ciudadano de cualquier país le gustaría ser acogido en un momento difícil, pero desde el punto de vista egoísta y casi puramente económico, aquí en España vivimos la, la primera gran llegada a la oleada de inmigración desde, no refugiados, pero sí inmigración desde Latinoamérica en el momento de más crecimiento económico y con el tema de los refugiados, aunque el estatus es muy diferente, está pasando igual en muchos países, ¿no? o sea, hay una contribución clara de, de esas personas que vienen de fuera, bueno, lo hemos visto en un montón de historias de países eh, exitosas. ¿no? Sí, lo que pasa es que aquí en la pregunta que, que hacían en Europe Talks hablaban de obligar. Sí, Tú, yo estoy a favor. Yo no, ¿ves? Yo esto, sí. esto es como siempre, a mí no de obligar, a mí siempre obligar no, eh, siempre utilizar este tipo de palabras, prohibir, obligar, me son un poco casi autocráticas, ¿no? Y fíjate, esto lo digo para... Porque antes hablando de la renta básica, como los países son diferentes, yo aquí en el tema de la migración también creo que son diferentes. Y creo que, por ejemplo, la idea que se tiene de la migración en los países de vicegrado no es la misma que se tiene en España. Claro, y la presión que tiene España, pero insisto, y estamos hablando, estamos hablando de refugiados. Y la presión que tienen algunos países como Polonia. Entonces, que, que a Polonia se le obligue a tener, pues, no sé, una cuota, un plan de asilo y tal, yo creo que, que, que Polonia debería tenerlo, ¿vale? Pero no se la puede obligar. Bueno, sí, lo que no puedes obligar es a tener la misma que otro país. Por su presión. De todas maneras, insisto, no es lo mismo la inmigración que los refugiados, porque España ha recibido eh, refugiados afganos y han venido de otra manera, se ha intentado establecer un corredor seguro y creo que ahí no hay nadie que estuviera en contra y Afganistán demostró que la experiencia de España se convirtió en una, en una referencia. Por eso digo que queremos leyes, pero no queremos leyes que obliguen a la gente a hacer una sociedad un poco mejor, ¿no? Y yo creo que este caso lo es. Bueno, yo, el, las leyes, siempre que exista un, un consenso social está bien, pero las leyes que implican eh, siempre prohibición, eh, al final, en esta... Obligación. Pero esto, obligación. Eh, obligación porque es lo políticamente correcto. No, porque es lo moralmente eh, aceptable, pa, incluso para el desarrollo económico de los países. O sea, tú no puedes, cuando tú estás imponiendo a alguien desde el punto de vista moral es muy peligroso. No, porque es económicamente bueno también para los países. Desde luego hay un punto moral de ver a gente ahogándose en el agua. O sea, esto es Ailán, el niño Ailán, la foto fue la que desencadenó todo. Pero luego es que creo que tiene una repercusión muy positiva también para los países y hay que hacer pedagogía. Como tú dices, no se puede generalizar. Es decir, no todos los países somos iguales. Creo que es verdad que todos tenemos la obligación moral de acoger refugiados, pero que si tú estableces leyes eh, a la carta para cada uno de los países para obligarse a acoger refugiados, se te puede volver a encontrar. ¿vale? Porque hay países que por, sus, por temas logísticos, eh, por temas culturales o porque tiene una frontera al lado donde ya tiene una presión migratoria de refugiados muy potente, encima obligarle, pues eh, puedes crear una corriente de opinión que es contraria incluso para formar esa gran Europa que queremos todos. Bueno, no teníamos que estar de acuerdo en todo, así que bueno, eh, ha estado bien. Europe Talks significa también eso, que podamos hablar y dialogar, aunque no se esté de acuerdo. Pero bueno, eso es, encontrar eh, acuerdos dentro de las opiniones diferentes, ¿no? Y, 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 no y no vernos como adversarios, sino como amigos, que eso es lo más importante. Eso. Bueno, Cardero, habrá que repetir en algún momento, ¿eh? que esto no ha quedado solucionado. Me encanta. Gracias. Ahora. Que sí, que yo me hago cargo, sin contrato, sin seguro. Sí, sí. Venga, si se cae y se rompe la crisma, le meto en la furgoneta y yo me hago cargo. Ya está. Te vienes conmigo al otro curro. ¿Sin contrato? Es lo que hay. Quita el chuco y enrolla el cable. ¿Chuco? ¿Qué es el chuco? Esto es el chuco. ¿Enchufe? Esto es enchufe. Enchufe es lo que tienen algunos. No entiendo. ¿No sabes lo que es tener en enchufe? Coches eléctricos tienen enchufe. Sí, eso también es verdad. Tú deberías cambiar tu coche por uno eléctrico. El tuyo contamina mucho. El furgoneta no contamina tanto el planeta. Lo que contamina son las grandes industrias. Si todo el mundo piensa como tú, el planeta ha acabado en dos días. Ya, pero no lo van a ver mis ojos. Lo verán ojos de tus hijos. ¿No te importa el mundo que dejas a tus hijos? No te enrolles y acaba que tenemos que ir al otro curro. ¿El otro curro tampoco como ese? No. Así no se vive. No, hombre, no, el otro curro mucho mejor. Tenemos que montar el escenario de Metallica. ¿Quieres uno? No, no, no. Venga, hombre, no te cortes. Eso no es nuestro. ¿Cómo que no? ¿Y de quién es? De ellos. Pero ellos no se los van a comer. ¿Y qué vamos a hacer? ¿Tirarlos a la basura? Pues no. Cuando digo ellos, no me refiero a ellos los que nos contratan. 
los políticos. No, encima de los políticos, los que están encima de la pirámide. ¿eh? Porque la sociedad es una pirámide, ¿lo sabías? Y nosotros debajo de pirámide. No, nosotros abajo, vosotros más abajo que abajo. Pues yo existo. Tengo mano y, soy, y tengo dignidad. Pues ya tienes algo, pero no lo digas muy alto que te lo Pues tengo más cosas. ¿Así qué cosas? Tengo familia y tengo cosas en las que creo. Bueno, pues deja de hablar y recoge. Porque yo tengo que recoger todo y tú nada. Yo sí recojo, ¿no lo ves? Además, ya le a la mesa del catering. Tú tienes mucho morro. Tú quieres que vaya contigo otro curro para que yo haga todo mientras tú comes bocadillos. Y sin contrato. Eh, 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 no te pases, ¿eh? Que te he colado aquí por la cara. Eso es tener enchufe. Como hacen políticos. Ah, sí, mira qué listo eres, sí. La mayoría de los políticos no saben hacer su trabajo. Hablan y no saben qué dicen. Prometen y nunca, nunca cumplen qué prometen. Bueno, por lo menos nos, en nuestro país tenemos democracia y podemos elegir a los políticos que nos mandan. ¿Tú crees que el pueblo elige quién manda? Sí. ¿Tú crees eso? Por eso votas como niño que va a buscar juguete para el día de su cumpleaños. Está todo en un escaparate, es todo publicidad. Los políticos están aquí para que veas cómo votan y lo bonitos que son. Son una caja maravillosa con muchas luces, pero luego cuando abre la caja no hay nada. Y las luces se acaban en dos días. Hostia, tío, me has dejado alucinado. ¿Por qué? ¿Ah? ¿Tú te crees que porque yo, yo vení de otro país más pobre, yo ser tonto? No, 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 no. Sí, 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 tú piensas eso. Y también piensas que nosotros venimos país para quitar trabajo a españoles parados, ¿verdad? Ah, sí, entonces ¿por qué te llevo conmigo? Para que yo haga todo el trabajo y tú nada, mientras comes bocadillos. ¿Me vas a pagar mitad de lo que ganas? Sí, hombre, lo que considera que te tengo que pagar, te he dicho. Pues mejor no voy. Como que no vienes? ¿Pero no necesitas el dinero? Necesito el dinero, pero también necesito dignidad. Pues con dignidad no se come. Pero puedo mirar la cara a mis hijos sin vergüenza. ¿Ah, sí? ¿Y cómo le vas a mirar a la cara cuando te digan que tienen hambre y no les des un tozo de pan para comer? Con pena, pero con dignidad. Ah. Ah, ah, ah. ¿Qué pasa, hermano? Ah, ah, pues, pues que me la he roto. Me caí esta mañana y al apoyarme creo que me he roto la muñeca. Por eso necesito que vengas al montaje de Metallica, ¿entiendes? Lo necesito, necesito ese trabajo. Porque a nosotros también nos explotan. Necesito que vengas conmigo. Necesito ese trabajo. Porque con esta mano... Déjame ver, hermano. Eh, no, 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 que está rota. ¿No lo ves que está hinchada? Pero... No está roto, está ah, dislocado. ¿Te duele así? Ah, ah, sí, sí, ¿Y sí. Así? Ah, así menos, así menos. ¿Cómo que...? Tú eres eh, machito eh, español. ¿Eh? Que si tú machito español. Da mucha honra. Pues aguanta. Ah, ah, ¿Ves? Ah, ya va, ya va, ya va. Ah, oh, 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 oh. Ya te dije que no rota, solo dislocada. Oye, tío, pero tú como... como... Yo en mi país fisioterapeuta. Aquí, currito. ¿Y por qué te has venido aquí? Por libertad, por dignidad. Y por trabajo. Sin libertad no hay posibilidad, posibilidad de pensamientos. Sin libertad no hay dignidad. Y yo quiero dignidad para mi hijo. Vale, ala, venga, vamos a coger el sofá. Venga. Vamos, que tienes que ir a otro curro. No, tenemos que ir al otro curro. Tu mano está bien, ya no me necesitas. Te necesito, y mucho. ¿De verdad? Os necesitamos, hermano. Os necesitamos. Hola, agradezco a las intervenciones y a las contribuciones de los periodistas Ana Pastor y Nacho Cadero por compartir sus vistas con nosotros. También quiero agradecer a los actores del Microteatro Madrid, especialmente a Patrick Mitogo y a Chete Guzmán, también al director y autor de la chiquitita obra, Nancho Novo, por su conversación interesante que hubiera sido en, en Europa, en cada ciudad. Así terminamos nuestra acción aquí en, en Madrid y saludos del capital aquí en Madrid. Muchísimas gracias por esa contribución de Madrid que a mí me pareció súper interesante y Madrid realmente es un sitio que amo mucho porque hace unos años viví ahí. Thank you very much, Madrid. That was very inspiring and interesting. And we would like to welcome the next speaker now, which is Emilia Roy. She is the founder and director of the Center for Intersectional Justice in Berlin. She holds a PhD in political science from both the Humboldt University in Berlin and Sciences Po in Lyon. 
In her work, she deals with questions of intersectionality, race, or critical race theory, and post-colonial studies. And I really enjoyed uh, reading her latest book, Why We Matter, The End of Oppression. And today, in her talk, she will give us a glimpse into her utopian vision on Europe, which is a very, very radical view on institutions such as marriage or nation states. I'm very happy to be talking about utopian futures today. Utopias are represented as something that is irrealistic, something that is unrealistic, something that is um, even in some ways immature, and representations that do not really have legitimacy in our society. But without utopia, utopian futures and representations, we would not be here today. It means that before any major social progress happens, it is always seen as utopian. For example, the abolition of slavery in the United States and in the entire Americas was considered a utopia at some point. Even people who wanted to abolish slavery started thinking about reform. So instead of wanting to abolish slavery, um, people thought that a world without slavery was not imaginable. A world without slavery could not exist because for several centuries it had structured the economic, political, cultural life of entire continents. And yet it happened. So at some point, utopia, utopian futures um, are starting to enter uh, our representation, our conscious representation and can make ways for change. That's the same with um, women's votes. For example, for a very long time, it was considered utopian for women to occupy political office, to be professors at university, to be renowned authors. And yet it happened. For a certain time, and not even that long ago, it was utopian for two women to marry and have children and found a family. Yet today it happens. So now I'd like to represent some of the institutions that we need to get rid of in order to move forward. Some institutions that I consider to be obsolete and even harmful and holding us back in the representation of a future without oppression. And these institutions are marriage. It means that marriage as an institution has been upholding patriarchy, patriarchal structures, and has contributed and continues to contribute to the inequality faced by women on a systemic, structural, and personal level. The, the marriage as an institution continues to uphold capitalist structures and um, the nation state as well, and all the, um, the, 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 the difficult aspects that it represents. So marriage as an institution should be replaced because the abolition of systems doesn't mean that it's the void that comes after that, that nothing will replace it. But the abolition of certain systems is the precondition for an entirely new fundamentally um, fundamentally new systems to emerge. Also learning from the past, learning from the past mistakes of um, the institutions we knew, but also having enough space to be able to unfold with freedom and uh, with a vision for the future. So marriage is one of the institutions. Another institution or other institutions that will need to be abolished in order to uh, dismantle oppression um, entirely would be the police and prisons. So it doesn't mean that we would be living in a, in a, in a society where um, chaos and criminality would, um, would rule the world, but instead of having police and prisons which are based on obsolete societal structures and which predominantly criminalize poverty and predominantly criminalize certain groups of the population which are already um, lacking access to resources, to political voice, etc. It means that these institutions would need to be replaced to ensure the security and the safety of all people, not just um, a certain, um, certain segment of society. Another institution that would need to be abolished and that I envision in utopian futures is um, the nation state and national borders. So all these institutions that I've mentioned appear to be institutions that we deem indispensable, timeless, and 
absolutely necessary for um, the normal functioning of the world. But it's not the case. It means that these institutions were invented, they can also be abolished and something else can emerge. So we need to have space and time and imagination in order to um, depict and, and, and give to life the world that we want. In this sense, utopian futures and their articulation are a tremendous force and have tremendous power in order to bring social progress. And I hope that we can continue together to think about utopians, uh, utopian futures. I hope that we have together the chance and the power to imagine utopian futures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emilia. Wow, that was really wonderful and inspiring and encouraging to dream big. You're watching the final event of Europe Talks. On this day and over the last the past couple of weeks, thousands of people from many European countries have met for one-on-one -on -one discussions to uh, discuss, uh, discuss the political questions, the controversial questions that are moving our societies today. We've seen contributions from London, from Poland, um, from Greece, um, from many other places across Europe, um, and we're now happy to actually have someone here with us today in Berlin in our little studio. Um, we're happy to welcome Nora Bosson. Uh, she is a poet, no novelist, and essayist. Um, in addition to several volumes of poetry, essays, and reports that she's written, she's also published um, many novels. The latest one was Schutzzone in 2019, which was um, nominated for the German Book Prize, followed by Auch Morgen Politische Texte, which was published in 2000 and 2021. Really happy to have you here in the studio um, to say some encouraging words before we go to the debates of the participants today. Thank you. Thank you. A friend of mine, lover of bibliophilic rarities, came across the first edition of Nabucco's Lolita in a second-hand bookshop. Two volumes, Paris, the Olympia Press, 1955, ornamented, original paperback. Estimated price, 2,200 euros. The fictional story of the middle-aged Humbert Humbert, who makes a prepubescent girl his lover, became a literary scandal of the 1950s. Even today, the story, tolerable at best for the sensitive reader, violates everything that seems right and good and would probably need a catalog of trigger warnings. Lolita, or the Confessions of the Widower of the White Race, as it's titled, puts the old white man in a despicable light. The novel is, above all, a work of stylistic brilliance, a requiem of transcendence, a moral la banque. But today, some long for moral clarity, like a boyo, to provide support and orientation in the stormy sea. This artistic fiction is reinterpreted as self-help, and the mere depiction of indecency is condemned to the detriment not only of literary fiction, but also of our, of our everyday lives, because the two have more to do with each other than we might think. Nuance and ambiguity are essential to good fiction, writes an Applebaum in a recent essay. They are also essential to the rule of law. We have courts, juries, judges and witnesses, precisely so that the state can learn whether a crime has been committed before it administers punishment. And that which applies to the judic judicial process can also be said in principle about how we pass judgment. The novel and its intimate gaze became the most important literary genre in the enlightened modern age. In return, the modern age was able to develop through the expanded imagination, change of perspectives, ambiguity and plurality of truth that the novel reveals. An epoch in which truth is no longer imposed as deus ex machina, but different interpretations of reality can complement each other. Today, however, we see that there is an increasing demand for unambiguous truth, for consistency and a clear distinction between good and evil. 
to a certain extent, this is understandable. When conspiracy theories seriously compete with scientific studies and in a global pandemic, we are left to rely on social solidarity, which is being undermined by misinformation and the refusal of a few to accept reality. However, we get caught in the game of conspiracy theorists when, in response, we deny that reality is itself ambiguous. Even science possesses ambiguity, which, under the pressure of acting quickly, is often presented as one scientific truth. In his last speech, as president of the Bundestag, Wolfgang Schäuble declared, and not without reason he thought it needed to be said, there is not one right decision in democracy. But it seems that the one right thing is increasingly expected, not only in democracy, but also in fiction. And the one right's judgment is to be passed on our everyday unity and struggle against each other. The new fear of ambiguity has armed itself with aggression and contradiction is leashed like the dog outside the pub. It may bark, but around the bar, it is no longer heard. When ambiguity is increasingly denied, when fiction as well as reality lose the dimension of openness, when the novel is no longer supposed to be the mirror or the mystery of society, but its ideal, then literature loses its explosive power, that of confronting us with the opposite of our convictions. Then the novel becomes an, ob an object that, at best, can be valued as an investment, estimated at 2,200 euros in the case of Lolita. If we want to rebel against this construction, we would have to actually destroy it as, as just that, as an investment object, like the artist Banksy destroyed his girl with a balloon. Following such a bold scandal with little insight, the shredded book is, of course, sold at a multiple of its estimated value according to the slate of hand of post-industrial capitalism. When what the indignant of 1955, like those of today, retrain, retain through their unambiguous reference to custom and morality, is the desire, if not the mandate, to judge the behavior of others. This leads rarely to conversation, rather to monologues sounding against each other, because those who think they have discerned right from wrong and good from evil no longer need any correction from others. Between restlessness and self-sufficiency, -suffic one keeps a firm grip on morality so that it does not manage the leap of, to ethics. This is part of the problem, because unlike morality, which can easily become a cut-and-paste ethos, means posture, and is only acquired through doubt and self-criticism. No one wants to live in an immoral world. However, morality, when left unchecked, can become dogmatic. It needs friction and opposition in order to remain alive. Aesthetic as well as intellectual disturbances are fundamental for our understanding of the world. If we block them out, we do not become more progressive, but rather slide into regression. We lose sight of ourselves as fractured, ambivalent beings. It is the tension of ambivalence, the endurance of paradoxes and obstacles, that makes our thinking strong and malleable. If it hardens, the window to the world closes, not only in the novel, and what was once an exhilarating flight to the unknown crashes into a vile exchange of investments.
Thank you so much, Nora Bosong, for those words. I think they're really inspiring um, and a great introduction and start to the conversations that will be happening on the internet all over Europe in a couple of minutes. Um, and a reminder to everyone participating in these conversations that there is no black and white and it's actually all about listening, which is what we always say when people ask us, what should we do going into these conversations? It's actually to listen and uh, to be open for uh, different perspectives on the questions um, that we have asked. But now, um, before we actually kick them off um, and end our little uh, studio, studio show here today, um, some final words from Hannah on the questions that will be discussed. Yeah, we actually already have come to the end of our this year's program. And for me, it was actually a real pleasure to be here. Same. Um, Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> and it really did feel like a real European experience because we had so many contributions from so many different cities all over Europe. And that was actually pretty cool, I must say. So before we leave you uh, into your one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, we would really like to thank all of our supporters, our media partners, the Goethe Institute for helping us put together our this year's program, our speakers, panelists, and of course you, the participants of Europe Talks. I think the pandemic is once again showing that polarization really is an issue and can become a threat to democracy. Uh, when political attitudes become an identity instead of just an opinion and when divides become stronger and stronger. So with Europe Talks, we really hope to at least make a small contribution to bridge those divides, to meet new people and to gain new perspectives, to have a good experience with other Europeans that think totally different from ourselves. For all of you who have already found a match, you can now leave and have a discussion on whatever platform you have chosen. And for uh, the rest of you, please stay here. And now as a quick reminder for all of you, <laughs> I would like to read out our questions again, so you bear them in my mind while you talk. Should same-sex marriages be recognized in all European countries? Is Europe too dependent on Russian energy? Should the EU exclude member states if they violate democratic standards? Should marijuana be legalized in all European countries? Should European countries accept more refugees? Should all European countries introduce an unconditional basic income? Should all European countries ban the sale of new fossil fuel cars by 2030? Should the coronavirus vaccination be mandatory? And should domestic flights be banned in all over Europe? Exactly. Those are the questions. Um, if you are registered in our hop in event um, and you don't have a discussion partner, there should be a button on the very left that says networking. And if you click on that now, um, you're going to jump into a, a private online room um, where you'll be introduced to a total stranger and you can debate these questions. And I encourage you all um, to do that now and have fun. If you haven't done any of this, if you have never signed up for Europe Talks, if you are not in the hop in event, but you do want to have that experience, it is still possible to sign up. You can go to europetalks.org and we will be doing another couple rounds of matching. You might meet someone from Iceland, Greece, <laughs> Norway or Portugal um, in the next few days. And with that, uh, we say thank you all for watching wherever you are in Europe. And um, we hope to see you again um, in one of the My Country Talks events. Goodbye. Thank you.